Okay, hello, welcome back again. All right, we're gonna do math with business applications today. We're working on the supplement yet. This is part eight. We're gonna talk about proportions this afternoon. So what we're gonna go over in this uh, particular PowerPoint is what a proportion is, how to set one up using word cues and how many different ways there are to set one up. Um, we want you to know how to verify whether or not a proportion is true or false. And then we're gonna look at solving proportions. I'm gonna talk about means extreme theorem, but really all that is is the cross multiplication. All right, so let's begin. A proportion is defined as a statement of equality for two ratios or rates. It should be noted that there is more than one way to set up a proportion, that oftentimes proportions themselves will contain fractions or decimals and that they can have fraction and decimal uh, answers. The important part of a proportion is making sure that your units match up. If your units are out of sync with each other, you will get a wrong answer. So we're going to start by setting up a proportion based on the following problem. The conversion rate of U.S. dollars to Japanese yen is one U.S. dollar uh, being worth 105 Japanese yen. This means that 20 U.S. dollars would be worth 2,100 Japanese yen. If we were setting this up to, I shouldn't say if, to set this up in a proportion, we're going to compare the two different units, that is US dollars and Japanese yen. The way in which we set up the statement of comparison determines where the numbers are going to go in our proportion. I'm going to initially take this proportion and write it out as US dollars compared to Japanese yen. Notice I'm putting the U.S. dollars in the numerator and the Japanese yen in the denominator. I know from the word problem that one U.S. dollar is the same as 105 Japanese yen. This is a rate. My units are different. Yes, they're both money, but they're different types of money. So U.S. dollars compared to Japanese yen. And because they are different units, I cannot cancel them out. I can, however, say that at this same rate, it has to be true that 20 US dollars is the same as 2,100 Japanese yen. Looking solely at the numbers, this would give me a proportion of one is to 105, the same way that 20 goes with 2,100 or 2,100. This then is our proportion. It is a statement of equality between two ratios or rates. So I just set that problem up one specific way. There are other ways. For example, as we saw in that last slide, I compared US dollars to Japanese yen. That gave me a proportion of one US dollar to 105 Japanese yen is 20 US dollars to 2100 or 1 over 105 is equal to 20 over 2100. I could have compared Japanese yen to US dollars. That would have flipped over my comparison, putting the Japanese yen on top as in 105 Japanese yen goes with one US dollar, the same way that 2,100 Japanese yen goes with 20 US dollars. This gives me a proportion that is true, but is different from the proportion we just set up. Instead, I have 105 over one is equal to 2,100 over 20. Here's the kicker. Both of these proportions are correct. There's nothing wrong in either of them. There were no parameters for how I had to set it up, which unit had to go in the numerator and which unit had to go in the denominator. So both of these are perfectly fine proportions. This can cause some issues. Because there are eight 
possible ways to correctly set up any proportion, we have to figure out, or at least be aware, of how to know if a proportion is set up correctly, or even if the proportion we set up is valid or true at all. So, first we're going to talk a little bit about how to verify a proportion. We do this using cross multiplication. So, I'm going to show you how to determine if the following setups are truly proportions. So, we're going to look at what looks to be a proportion. 2 is to 5, just like 4 is to 10. And we're going to do a cross multiplication. This is also known as the means extremes product theorem, where the means and extremes are the cross products. Well, what do I mean by cross products? Well, as you look at this particular proportion, you will see four quadrants. The 2, the 5, the 4, and the 10 are each in a different quadrant. The cross product means I'm going to multiply across the 2 times the 10. And if I multiply 2 times 10, I get 20. 20, then, is our first cross product. I can also take the second cross product, which is multiplying 5 times 4. 5 times 4 is also 20. So the cross product, the second cross product of 5 times 4 is also 20. Comparing these cross products, we see that they are the same. This equality, the fact that the cross products are equal, indicates that what we have is a valid proportion. In our second example, I'm going to give you 8 over 11, or 8 elevenths is the same as 4 sevenths. And I'm going to use the cross products again to verify whether or not this is true. So I'm going to take the first crossed product, 8 times 7, which is 56. And I'm also going to take the second cross product, which is 11 times 4, or 44. When I look at those cross products, the first being 56, the second being 44, I see that these two cross products are not equal. This means that the proportion is invalid. What do I mean by invalid? I mean that 8 elevenths is not the same as 4 sevenths. They're not equal. So, third example. 33 hundredths over 12 hundredths is the same as 6.7 over 2.6. Using our cross products, 0.33 times 2.6 is 0 0.858. The second cross product is 0.12 times 6.7, and that gives me 0 0.804. Notice that these are not the same, and because they're not the same, that means that this proportion is invalid. It is false. It is not true that 33.33 over 0.12 is the same as 6.7 over 2.6. Not equal. Doesn't work. And then lastly, I wanted to show you one with fractions because this is going to look like a hot mess, but it's really done the exact same way. What you have to be careful of here is where your four quadrants are. I am going to draw in the four quadrants. Uh, yeah, let's draw it in. I'm going to draw in the four quadrants so that I can clearly see where my cross multiplications are. And I'm going to take the first cross multiplication, which is 6 and 3 fifths times 5 elevenths. And I'm going to do it on a calculator. I mean, I can do it longhand, but I would also do that on a calculator. And when I do that particular mathematics, I will get a 3. I'm then going to take the second cross product, which is 5 and 4 sevenths times 7 thirteenths, and I will again get 3. Notice that these are the same. 
since the cross products are the same, the proportion itself is valid. To sum it up, if your cross products are equal, that shows you that your proportion is valid. That means your proportion is true. Unequal cross products will show you that a proportion is invalid or false. We use this means extremes theorem or the cross multiplication in order to solve a proportion when we have a missing value. So when a proportion is missing a value, we use cross multiplication to find it. That missing value can be placed in any part of the proportion. The process will be the same. Looking at the given proportion, notice I have an x over 1.5 is equal to 2.1 over 6. This tells me I want the proportion to be valid, but I do not know what number goes above the 1.5. What number compares to 1.5, the same way that 2.1 compares to 6. Given only a single missing value, I can go ahead and use my cross multiplication so that I have x times 6, which is indeed 6x, and I have 1.5 times the 2.1, which is 3.15. If this is a true or valid proportion, those two must be equal. This sets up an equation a simple basic algebraic equation that I can then solve by dividing both sides by the coefficient of x, in this case, 6. So I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by 6. 6x divided by 6 is going to leave me with x. And then 3.5 divided by 6, I'm going to, 3.15, sorry, I'm going to do on my calculator. And when I do that on my calculator, I get 0 0.525. I have two other examples here that I will quickly talk through. The first uses 8 over 7 is equal to 24 over D. Notice the placement of the missing variable is in the lower right quadrant. That's fine. I still want to cross multiply. I'm going to do 8 times D, which is 8D. I'm going to do 7 times 24 on the calculator to get 168. If the proportion is valid, these two must be equal. So to solve it, I must set those cross products equal. Then I can divide both sides by the coefficient of that variable, 8 to get that D has to equal 168 divided by 8, or 21. We've done decimals. We've done whole numbers. You know what's next. Here we go with fractions. Here I have 11 thirds over K is equal to 6 over 5. And again, if you want to be sure of your quadrants, go ahead and draw those lines in. Then we can see that we have 11 thirds times 5. That's 55 over 3. I'm not going to simplify it any further right now. And that has to equal 6 times k or 6k. Now, because they have to be equal, I can simply divide both sides by the coefficient of the k, that is, divide both sides by 6. To get that 55 over 18 is equal to k. Notice I am leaving this in fraction form. I am not switching it to decimal. Be aware that in different parts of the assignment, you will be asked for decimals and for fractions. It's important that you know how to do both. All right. We're going to take this one step further, and we're going to talk about solving proportions with word problems. I have like five or six examples here. So here's our first setup. For 20 cabinets, we used 56 feet of boards. So how much board would be used for 28 cabinets? To begin, I like to determine what's being compared in the ratio or the rate. So in that very first sentence, we have 20 cabinets for 56 feet of board. This tells me that my comparison is cabinets compared to feet of board. 
Now, I know I can set up the proportion using those units, cabinets over the feet of a board. So I'm going to take my cues from the word problem again. We know that 20 cabinets go with 56 feet of board. This gives me the first half of the proportion, 20 cabinets over 56 feet of board. That has to be in the same rate, so just as, meaning equal to, 28 cabinets goes with an unknown amount of feet of board. So 28 goes with, I don't know. So to simplify this a little bit the way I write it anyway, I'm going to do 20 over 56 is equal to 28 over x. Now that I've got a proportion set up, all I need to do is use my cross multiplication, also known as the means extremes theorem, to do 20 times x, which is 20, and 56 times 28, or 1568, and set them equal. Now that I have this little equation, I can simply divide both sides by the coefficient of x. So I'm going to divide both sides by 20 to get x is equal to 78.4. Now, as long as I've been careful, I know that my x was in the denominator and that that was the feet of board. So I know that my 78.4 is the feet of boards needed for 28 cabinets. All right, here we go with some examples. I strongly suggest that you stop if you need to, just to take it in for a moment after a problem is done. Uh, but yeah, here we go. All right. An inspector of 125 Blu-ray players found that eight were defective. If a batch of 45,500 players was shipped out, how many should you expect to be defective? So it's important to know what exactly it is that you're comparing. I'm going to state it differently than you may state it, and that's fine. We just need to be consistent in our placement then. So I'm going to state it as the number of defective players compared to the total number of players. It's in the first sentence, 125 players, eight defective. So we're talking about the defective players out of the total. This is eight out of 125. That has to be the same as, now, do I know how many are defective in the batch of 45,500? I do not. So since I don't know how many are defective out of a total of 45,000, that's going to give me my x over 45,500. Then to cross multiply, I'll have 125 times x has to equal 8 times 45,500 or 364,000. Dividing both sides by the coefficient, I get 364,000 divided by 125, which is 2,912. That means I should expect to find 2,912 players defective. Here's a similar one. My life insurance policy charges $2.13 per $1,000 of coverage per year. If my policy is for $500,000 of coverage, half a million dollars, what should my annual cost be? What should the monthly cost be? All right, let's talk. I'm comparing the amount they charge me, $2.13, to the total coverage. So I'm comparing the charge on my policy to the coverage per year. I know that $2.13 is what is charged for every $1,000. At that rate, I don't know how much is going to be charged on my $500,000 policy. So I can set that up as X over 500,000. To cross multiply, I would have 1,000 X is equal to 2.13 times 500,000 or $1,065,000. Dividing both sides by the coefficient of X, I get 
x is equal to $1,065. This is my charge for the year. Monthly, my monthly cost means I would need to divide the 1065 by 12, and that's going to give me $88.75. So annually, I'm going to be charged $1065, and if I divide that by 12, I get a monthly charge of $88.75. Example three is something we're probably all pretty familiar with. On a recent trip, a car used 18 gallons of gasoline to travel 350 miles. At this rate, how many gallons of gasoline will they need on a 575 mile trip? All right, so what am I comparing? I'm comparing the gallons of gasoline to the miles traveled. We know that 18 gallons accounted for 350 miles. That has to be the same as an unknown number of gallons and 575 miles. When we cross multiply, we get 350x has to be the same as 1,350, dividing both sides by 350, the coefficient of x. We get x is equal to 29.571428. That was not a nice number. So you want to make sure you check and, for, and make sure that you're rounding to the requested decimal place. In this case, it does say round your answers to the nearest tenth. The tenth place is a five. There we go. That seven is going to round the five up to six. So 29.6 gallons of gas are going to be needed to go the 575 miles. Food related. At the Fridays, the restaurant, at the Fridays, yeah, the ratio of food dollars to drink dollars sold is 8 to 5. So the total sales for the night was 42,500. What was the amount in dollars of drinks sold? This one takes a little bit. They've told us that the ratio of food dollars sold to drinks dollars sold is nine is eight to five. The ratio of food dollars to drink dollars sold was eight to five. So if we look at that ratio, what we need to get out of that is that if the food dollars were eight and the drink dollars were five, this means that the total dollars would be the food plus the drink, or 13. And I need that 13 because they've only given us 42,500 as the total amount, total sales of both food and drink. And from that, I have to pick out what the drink dollars were. So I need to, to calculate the drink dollars compared to the total dollars. I know that out of the total, the drink dollars would have been five, and the total would be the 13, or eight plus three. This has to be the same as some unknown amount out of 42,500. And again, we would cross multiply from here, so that we have 13x is equal to 212,500, dividing both sides by 13. We would get a value x, of 16,346.15385. Now, this is a money problem. So money is always to the hundredth, as in cents. So this would be $16,346.15 worth of drinks sold. This next example is a little bit longer. It's a little bit more involved, which is why it gets its own page. All right, let's say we know that our car wash three students can wash five cars in one hour. We want to determine how many cars can 10 students get done in an hour. And if the group of students went ahead and washed cars for six hours and charged $8 a car, how much money could they make? And then if they split that money evenly, how much would each student get? So 
We're going to start with part A. We know that three students can wash five cars in one hour. So we're going to look at the comparison of the number of cars that can be washed based on the number of students. And we know that five cars get washed by three students. This has to be the same in that same hour as how many cars getting washed by 10 students. So if there are 10 students, how many cars can get washed? Cross multiplying, we see that 50 or five times 10 is equal to three X. And dividing both sides by the coefficient, we get 50 over three has to be our X value. I'm going to go ahead and convert that to a mixed number because we're talking about the number of cars and 50 over 3 just doesn't make any sense. And that would be 16 and 2 thirds is the number of cars that 10 students can wash in an hour. However, here's the thing. Nobody's going to be happy if you wash 2 thirds of a car. So in a single hour, the only number that can be done is 16. We can assume that they will get 16 cars fully completed in an hour. It's important to note that both the 16, which is the answer here, and the 16 and 2 thirds are useful. Because when we do the next problem, if this group of students washed cars for six hours, now that 2 thirds of a car that didn't get washed in the first hour can get carried over into the second hour. So I really want to multiply the number of cars, not at 16, but at 16 and 2 thirds times six, the number of hours, and they're going to charge $8 an hour. So I'm gonna multiply this by $8 again. When I put this into a calculator, I get 800. 50 over three, or 16 and two thirds, times six, times eight, gives me $800. So that means that a total of $800 can be made this car wash. Since there are 10 students washing cars, <laughs> I'm gonna take that 800 and divide it evenly amongst the 10 students to get $80. So in six hours, each student made $80. This is our last example. Here we have a restaurant that can make 22 sub sandwiches in 40 minutes. So if lunch is gonna last three and a half hours, how many sub sandwiches can they make? If each sub can feed five people, how many people can be fed? And if each person pays $3.25 for their lunch, how much money will the restaurant take in? So starting with the first one, I need to recognize that three and a half hours should be converted to minutes. I'm comparing subs to minutes. So if we have 22 subs in 40 minutes, that has to be the same as how many subs in 210 minutes. I can't use a three and a half here. We're not talking about three and a half minutes. We're talking about three and a half hours. And since there are 60 minutes in each hour, I need to do three and a half times 60 to get the number of minutes. And when I do that, I get 210. When I cross multiply, I have 22 times 210, which is 4,620, is equal to 40 times x. My coefficient on the x is 40. So I'm going to divide both sides by 40, giving me 115.5 is equal to x. Now, since X is the number of sandwiches and I can't make half of sandwich, I'm going to say that in three and a half hours, they can make 115 sub sandwiches. Now, that's how many whole sub sandwiches they can make. If each sub feeds five people, well, normally I would take the 115 times five, but if I'm trying to get everything out of it, then even that half a sub is going to get fed to somebody, right? So I'm going to take 115.5 times 5 to get 575. 
that means that, oops, 577, I guess that should be. There we go. That means that a total of 577 people can be fed. Then since 577 people are being fed, I can charge each of them 325. And when I do that, I get $1,875.25. So the restaurant will take in $1,875.25. This is our last example. So we can look at the possible practice problems. For extra practice, you can find some problems in your supplement on page 20. You can do problems 10 through 40 as they all relate to the proportions. The alternative is in your ebook in objective 5.5. This is a part of the chapter five, section two review. You can look at problems 20 through 29. There is also a graded assignment. This is on WebAssign. It is called Proportions. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, your instructor, or our mass support personnel for the course. Thank you.